The News 4 Rundown is sponsored by FH Fur. A youth soccer coach attacked tonight. He tells Northern Virginia Bureau Chief Julie Carey about the parent he says pummeled him over playing time. Plus, drivers ticketed for following the speed limit. Fairfax County Police say cameras in three school zones were falsely issuing speeding tickets. We'll tell you where in Northern Virginia drivers got those false citations. And it is the first day of school in some of the area's largest school districts. How students are being welcomed back to the classroom while making safety a priority. You're watching the News 4 Rundown. Thanks for joining us for the News 4 Rundown, our newscast streaming for you. I'm Anya. I'm Tommy McFly. It's Monday, August 28th. We begin, though, with a tragedy on a college campus. A University of North Carolina official now says a faculty member was shot and killed in a campus laboratory building this afternoon. The campus in Chapel Hill was locked down for most of the day after officials reported an armed and dangerous person was on or near campus. A short time ago, the campus said a suspect was arrested and there was no longer a threat to the public. Video appears to show the person police had called a person of interest being taken into custody. Again, police say a faculty member was shot and killed. A suspect is in custody and there is no longer a threat to the public. Now let's get a check on some of our top stories closer to home. A controversial Maryland sheriff says he's returning to duty. Frederick County Sheriff Chuck Jenkins made an announcement today. Now you might remember Jenkins put himself on self-imposed leave of absence following an indictment in an alleged machine gun scheme. He's accused of conspiring with a gun shop owner and using his official credentials to obtain illegal guns. A 16 year old from Waldorf is facing murder charges for stabbing on U Street. She's accused of stabbing and killing another teen. DC police say Naima Ligon died at the hospital. Someone drove her there around two Sunday morning. Police believe she was stabbed both inside and outside of the McDonald's at 14th and U Streets that morning. Naima was a student at Thomas Stone High School. Grief counselors were there today to help. A security officer at a historically black university in Jacksonville, Florida, is being lauded a hero. Lieutenant Antonio Bailey confronted a suspicious person at Edward Waters University campus on Saturday. That person turned out to be the gunman who later went on a racially motivated shooting spree that killed three black people before he took his own life. Investigators say Lieutenant Bailey likely prevented a massacre at the university. And only on four, a well-known Northern Virginia soccer coach is recovering from injuries tonight after he was attacked by a parent. And Prince William County Police say he was beaten on Saturday around 1 o'clock at George Helwig Park. So Northern Virginia Bureau Chief Julie Carey talked to the coach about what happened and why it has him questioning a role he's always loved. We want to warn you some of his injuries may be disturbing. And I was disoriented. And, and it hurts just to look at Vince Villanueva's face, especially his blackened and swollen eye. The orbital wall fractured. Some of what happened Saturday afternoon, a bit unclear. I, I'm pretty sure I was unconscious. Um, so I have no clue what happened. Coach Vince, as he's fondly called, has been coaching youth soccer, mostly girls teams, since he was 18. Saturday, he was on this field filling in as a favor for a friend, directing a boys' team scrimmage. So I saw one of the players kind of off with his dad, and he looked upset. I said, are you ready to go back in? And the dad said, um, no, he's not okay. Um, can I talk to you? And I said, sure. Vince says he was looking at the field as the parent walked toward him. As I was turning to talk to the father, um, the next thing I know is on the ground. And then I heard like a ding noise. And I realized I was getting hit in the head with a water bottle. Prince William County Police say the man who allegedly attacked Vince ran away, but officers arrived and arrested him nearby. Some off-duty first responders tended to Vince as parents called 911. And I saw parents running around, like grabbing kids. You know, there was a, a sense of panic um, all over the place. And I, I saw people coming up to me. At the hospital with his daughter, a CT scan revealed the fracture. Today at home, Coach Vince was sending the medical forms into police. Vince Villanueva works for the Prince William County Schools in the IT department. He loves coaching so much, he leads the Potomac High School girls team and youth club teams. Mike Potter's eight-year-old daughter is one of his players. He really cares about the kids. He cares about the sports, um, about the sport. He, he spends a lot of time devoted to the club and to others. He's a great individual. Charged with malicious wounding, 45-year-old Virand Hoja. 
Coach Vince says the attack now has him questioning his future as a coach. Seeing the escalation of like violence towards coaches and like game officials and stuff like that within these sports, I'm still processing, like thinking about, you know, is this something that I want to continue doing? But Coach Vince also hopes what happened to him will send a message to other parents about how they behave at games and matches. My big thing is just allow your kids to enjoy it. Let the volunteers and people that are out there um, trying to help your kids, allow them to do that too and support them. Reporting for News 4, I'm Julie Carey. Thanks, Julie. What a wild story. Kids just, sports, people. I mean, and it was a scrimmage mm -hmm. and the fact that the man assaulted the coach to see those injuries, so disturbing. And we contacted the Northern Virginia Soccer Club's lawyer about the attack and the lawyer responded saying that they have no comment at this time. Well, Chipotle is paying up after allegations of violating child labor laws in the district. The D.C. Attorney General started investigating following reports of violations in other jurisdictions. That investigation turned up 800 possible violations in D.C. over the course of three years. Chipotle has 20 restaurants in D.C., but the Attorney General is not saying which locations are accused of violating child labor laws. So now Chipotle has to come to an agreement to address these issues, and it includes paying $300,000 dollars in fines, implementing new policies to help comply with D.C.'s child labor laws, formal training for restaurant managers and supervisors about those child labor laws, and having store managers review child labor laws with newly hired minors. If you recently received a speed camera ticket in the mail, I, I get these once in a while, you may so want... So infuriating when it happens. Right? You may want to check the date and location, though. News 4 has learned that a number of school zone speed cameras in Northern Virginia were falsely issuing speeding tickets. So we got a News 4 viewer email. Love when he sent his emails, by the way, because he got a ticket in July when school oh. in Fairfax County was not in session. Now, Fairfax County police tell us there was an issue with the calibration of the flashing lights and the speed cameras. And we've learned of the problem at Key Middle School, also Irving Middle School in Springfield and London Town Elementary in Centerville. Now, our transportation reporter, Adam Tuss, has been all over this looking into it, and he's learned that all tickets issued in error will be voided. They're going to refund everybody's money who paid in full. What do you think about that? I hope I get my money back. <laughs> and I hope that I get the processing fee as well, because it was the $50 plus a $5 processing fee. So summer vacation officially came to a close today oh, mm -hmm. for tens of thousands of students in our area. In Montgomery County, Clarksburg High School students were greeted with a DJ and cheerleaders to get them pumped up for the first day back. The band and dance team were outside bright and early as well. One teacher explained the importance of building relationships with students to keep them motivated. I actually work uh, during the summer a lot, so I do a lot of trainings. Um, but the last week, um, I've just been working with my teachers on just making sure that we're intentionally building time to connect with our students and build relationships. First day of school photos on the internet too. Plenty of excitement in the district. More than 50,000 students hit the halls of the district's 115 public schools. Like many other school systems in our area though, the district is committed to making sure kids stay safe and they stay in class. The school system is saying truancy has actually been an issue since the pandemic and Chancellor Lewis Farabee addressed that today. We want to remind all of our, our families and our students that every day counts. Uh, and that is part of our mantra, ensuring that every student is present every day. It starts with ensuring that our students are on time. And it's something that we'll continue to monitor throughout the school year. Now, Chancellor Farabee didn't have truancy data on hand today, but online DCPS data shows that one in four kids in the district are chronically absent. That means they miss 10 percent or more of the academic year. And speaking of DCPS, President Biden and the First Lady visited students and staff at Elliott Hine Middle School in Northeast. The mayor was also on hand to bring greetings on this first day of classes there. As a teacher herself, First Lady Dr. Biden gave students some words of wisdom as they embarked on a new school year. 
So we've been telling you that COVID cases have been on the rise and in some parts of the county or the country, rather, schools have temporarily shut down even due to these outbreaks. Yeah, get this. In Kentucky, attendance in one of the area's schools dropped 20 percent within the first two weeks of school. That forced the district to close for several days. Over in Atlanta, students at Morris Brown College are required to wear masks for the next two weeks due to an uptick in cases. Now, the CDC is encouraging everyone to get that booster shot, the one they're expecting to be available next month. It's like going back a mm -hmm. couple of years in time when it was a crisis. I know, you hear masks and you're like, eh, right. are we doing that again? Schools shutting down? Yeah. Well, an epidemic of gun violence is impacting this country, and that has some local schools embracing new technology, artificial intelligence to keep students and faculty safe. Yeah, check this out. Investigative reporter Tracy Wilkins for the News 4 I team got an inside look at some of the AI revolution that's been going on to prevent future tragedies in the classrooms. <laughs> As the doors open once again at schools in Prince William County, Principal Matthew Fidian makes it a point to greet every one of his students. Safety and security is on everyone's mind. But this year, something else will be watching too at Bull Run Middle. It definitely gives me a peace of mind. A new weapons detection system called Evolve using sensors and artificial intelligence to detect potentially dangerous weapons walking through the front door. Okay, what just happened? So as you can see, the system alerted on something on my right hip. Jill Lamond is the director of education for Evolve, now in more than 600 schools nationwide. It's looking at uh, objects that may be threatening, but ignoring other everyday metallic items. And so what it's not picking up is my keys, for example, or, or my cell phone. Lamond says it's able to scan close to 2,000 people an hour through a single line. And unlike regular metal detectors, it can provide a specific location noted with that red box. Those individuals who do have an alert are going to go to a secondary search area where someone who's been well trained is going to look in a very particular spot for that item. I feel like a lot of people think, oh, that'll never happen to us. And then one day it does and you just are so surprised by it. Eighth grader Olivia McBride told the IT she welcomes the high tech tool. It just adds a different level of security that can help um, teachers because they have so much going on. Including the threat of guns and other weapons. The News 4 I team found 71 weapons recovered in Prince William County schools in the 21 to 22 school year. That number dropped last year. We have to prepare for everything. We have to be right all the time. Jason Stoddard is the director of school safety and security in Charles County, Maryland, where the number of weapons recovered jumped 25 percent over the last two school years from 70 to 88. They're now the first school district in the state to use AI to detect guns and potential active shooters. It is constantly scanning um, our exterior cameras for the presence of people, and then it looks for a weapon, um, and then it looks for what they're doing. The Omni Alert system, which taps into already placed security cameras, not only looks for guns, but physical behavior or movements consistent with potential violence. We get an automatic notification um, through um, an electronic means, through a text message or an app on our phone, and then we get to see the video and the pictures of what's going on to determine um, whether we would call the police or not. Also new this school year, panic buttons installed in every main office in case of any emergencies, not just with weapons. Students in Charles County are also not allowed to carry backpacks around between class, something that changed after two guns were found inside bags back in 2019. And while Stoddard says technology plays a part, he still thinks building those open relationships between students and staff is key. Our kids can't learn if they don't feel safe. Our staff's not going to teach if they don't feel safe. Back in Prince William County, the new AI screening system is being rolled out to all middle and high schools with training underway. I hope that it helps the students, first and foremost, feel comfortable because we want them to come in these doors into a learning environment, into a social environment. And while AI can sometimes raise privacy concerns, Principal Fidian says he hasn't heard any complaints from parents. I think there'll be an initial transition getting used to the system and um, having the students familiar with what to do. A new tool he hopes will be a deterrent. Our staff will still greet the students with smiles and um, high fives. So students can keep their focus on learning. In Gainesville, Virginia, Tracy Wilkins, News 4 IT. Thanks a lot, Tracy, and more to come on the News 4 Rundown. The D.C. Jazz Fest is back with a stellar lineup, 100 concerts, 30 venues all across the district. We've got a preview and a performance on the way. Plus, today marks 60th anniversary of the March on Washington. Our Sean Yancey sat down with a group of three different generations to discuss 
who should carry the torch now in a place that civil rights leader Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. would frequent for lunch. Whether you need electrical, plumbing, or HVAC service, FH First expert technicians have you covered. Now, during our Super Summer Comfort event, schedule any of FH First award-winning services and score $75 off. That's an astonishing $75 off any electrical, plumbing, or HVAC service now only during FH First Super Summer Comfort event. From flickering lights, pesky leaks, to keeping you cool during the sweltering summer heat, you know who to call. 877-GOFFER-FHFIRE.COM if you're sticking around for Labor Day weekend, you are in for a treat. DC Jazz Fest is back. New artists, multiple stages, which means all that jazz. I feel like I have to do jazz hands or something. Time is joined by some <laughs> special guests. DC Jazz Festival kicks off on Wednesday with over 100 concerts in 30 venues in all eight wards of the district. Sunny Sumter, jazz is usually like a very relaxing thing for audiences, but as CEO, festival's coming. Is jazz stressing you out right now? It is not stressing me out. Great. I'm all about the experience of jazz and all the excitement, so I'm excited about it. What are you cooking up that's new for someone who's gone to Jazz Fest every year? Well, the most exciting thing is we're five days, we're back citywide. And so we're starting off at it with an embassy event opening night over in Georgetown. International. Week, and that's right, international, <laughs> that's where we're going. But we also love to say that we are all things DC. We have over 50 uh, DC jazz uh, artists that are performing, which is exciting this year. What about a newbie, someone who's like, hey, I've heard good things about this jazz festival, maybe I'll check it out. There's a reason why they've heard good things. Okay. Because they're coming for the experience to learn about a new artist, to check out an international artist to see Gregory Porter, who's coming to the anthem. Uh, the String Queens are opening up for them. Everybody loves the String totally. Queens here in D.C. And we've got four stages at the Wharf, which includes two outdoor and two indoor stages. And speaking of all the awesome artists, you brought a real-life awesome artist for us to check out today. So Brent Burkhead is joining us as well, a Morgan State professor, a Howard University grad. You've toured with Lauren Hill and Nas and Wale. What brings you to DC Jazz Fest? Why, why do you like playing DC Jazz Fest? Well, I like playing DC Jazz Fest because they always bring out the, the premier artist in the genre. Your album, Burkhead, from 2019 is awesome. I've been streaming it all Thank day. You, so you got much. your new album coming out. I do. Can, uh, you, can you tell us the title of it? Th well, this is going to be the first that people are hearing of it. It's called Cacao. Nice. Um, and cacao is the main ingredient in chocolate. Um, and it kind of takes me on a, a new journey from my sound, which is, uh, which is cooler, which is smooth. Smoother um, and more fluent uh, as I've grown as a musician and a composer. I mean, you brought the sax. Could you I give did. us a it's little? Right here. Could I, you give us a little improvisation? Let's, let's see what we got. All right. <laughs> Okay, thank you so thank much you so for much. bringing your improvisation and your, your talent to our, uh, yeah, our stage me. today. There it is. Brent's playing, you know, you've got a whole lineup. Samara Joy, Samara Joy, <laughs> the Grammy New Artist for 2023, mm -hmm. is coming to Jazz Fest. We've got Arturo Farrell, who's bringing a salsa orchestra. He's going to be performing. Dave Holland. Oh, my goodness. Oren Evans. There's so many great performers that's, that's performing. I can't, Kenny Garrett. It goes Terry Lynn Carrington. Can you play us out as we, as we make our way out of here, Brent? Yes, indeed. Awesome. Don't miss all that musical talent. Well, today marks the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Iconic civil rights leader Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. led that march and forever etched his place in U.S. history as a torchbearer. 60 years later, who is carrying that torch forward? Our Sean Yancey sat down with people from three different generations at our table for four to ask them who they think should carry the torch now. I have a dream. It's been 60 years since Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. shared his dream with the nation. The torchbearer of justice was the leader of a generation, but an assassin's bullet cut his life short. Since then, millions of people all across our nation have made countless calls for improved civil rights, gay rights, human rights, and women's rights. No one will be discarded from this movement. 
We will stand together. But in Dr. King's absence, who picked up and carried the torch? We used what we had to bring about a nonviolent revolution. So who's the torch bearer now, and who will carry that torch into the future? Uh, I want y'all to be here for that. Three generations have a seat at our table for four to discuss carrying on the torch and who's got next. It's my time to be able to leave a legacy. The president of Howard University Student Association and member of the class of 2024. I don't think we need one person. I think we need more of a group. A native Washingtonian who attended the 1968 March on Washington as a Howard University sophomore. I can't think of who that might be and that may be part of our Problem. A motivational speaker and family owner of the iconic Ben's Chili Bowl. People are afraid to leave because the system, the establishment, the man, as it were, has broken so many people down, right? And people, I think, are afraid to leave. Since then, who, who carried that torch? And then along with that besides who's carrying the torch does does there need to be one person that carries that torch and you know I'll, let me ask you I mean what, what are your thoughts on that I mean have we had individuals have we passed the torch who should be carrying that I think it may need to be more than one person perhaps with different aspects one to attack the over racism one to attack what's going on with the police one to inspire the youth. I agree. I don't think we need one person. I think we need more of a group. Um, for example, when Black Lives Matter was around and it was very big, I think that was amazing for black people, very, very empowering. But since then, it's kind of dwindled down. You don't hear that much about it. But this is really the time where we need to come together as a people, where we need advocacy, where we truly need a leader or a group to lead. Because, like she was saying, whether it's with police brutality, whether it's with gun violence, which is running rampant oh through our God. community, whether it's looking into politics, seeing what's going on, having those people really stand up and let us know you, you need to vote. You can't just vote during certain elections. You need to be out there all the time, especially now with the Supreme Court. The fact that now not only are women's rights being attacked, our education is being attacked. Mm -hmm. With everything that's going on with affirmative action, I don't think, I don't think people are really seeing what's going on and understanding the implications that it has, and understanding this is not only like our lives, but the next generation they're going to have to come up with this. Much to your point, Mia, is is I talked to some young people during that, you know, Black Lives Matter, and I said, I said, I said, tell me about that. I said, because I'm old school, we're used to having the leader, and you know, and Martin Luther King was a, a unifying leader. Right. There are other leaders who, you know. You know, you, you, you like them, you like them, but they're not as unifying right, as other right, people, right. right? And so everyone can't agree to those leaders. But Martin Luther King was one of the rare ones. But I asked the young people, I said, "Well, who is the leader?" And they said, "Social media is the leader." And they said, "We don't want a singular leader because a leader can be killed, a leader can be compromised, you know, a leader can be bought off or, or whatever." They said, "So we don't want a singular leader." And, and they've seen the weakness in that. And not only that, but not only that, but people are afraid to lead because. The system, the establishment, sure. the man, as it were, has broken so many people down, mm -hmm. right? And people, I think, are afraid to leave. Sean Yancey reporting. Mm -hmm. Such a great conversation. Mm -hmm. An important one. And there's a lot more to it, too. Right here in the NBC Washington app, you can find more of Sean's conversation and Table for Four. Plus, it's the end of a panda partnership. I know you're very sad about this. Very, very sad. <laughs> Between China and the Smithsonian National Zoo. We have a look at one of the last birthday celebrations for a beloved resident before the zoo's pandas have to go to China. Very important question. Is there such thing as too much wine? I have never heard such a thing. Well, for France, the answer is yes. Washington Post is reporting that the country has to destroy no. so much no, wine no. that it could fill 100 Olympic-sized swimming pools. Wait, this has to be criminal. Well, it's going to cost them, too, $216 million to get rid of it. Now, before you... How does this make sense? Here's the deal. I'll make it make sense. Okay, There's an explanation. <laughs> the report says that it's getting so expensive to make wine because of recent world events and people are actually drinking less wine. Okay. And it's left the country's most famous wine regions, like Bordeaux, in a state of flux. Well, that's because Bordeaux is very expensive. Maybe they should just reduce <laughs> the cost 
of certain wines. Put it in boxes. Bordeaux, Burgundy, <laughs> right, champagne, and just make it more affordable. Instead of destroying it, maybe they can make some of that money back. Yeah. Just, just a thought. They're going to be turning some of it into, like, alcohol, other yeah, cleaners and that sort of things to help out. All right. I'm no wine expert. All right. A bittersweet <laughs> birthday for one of D.C.'s most beloved residents. Tian Tian turned 26 yesterday. Hmm. Marking the final time the National Zoo will be able to celebrate a panda birthday. This breaks my heart, you know. You're the panda person. I love them so much. They're adorable. All three pandas, Tian Tian, Mei Shang, the mom, and their most recent offspring, Xiao Qi Ji, will return to China later this year. So the older pandas arrived in D.C. in 2000 as part of the Conservation and Breeding Partnership, which dates back 50 years. Wow. Ling Ling Sing Sing, the original 10 year agreement involving Tian Tian and Mei Shang has been extended several times. But amid political tensions with China's government, it appears it will not be extended again, and all three will be going to China by the end of the year. Uh, Remember the other cubs that they had also yeah. went to China, but it's been such a successful program. So we haven't received a formal date when it will happen. You'll remember the three of their offspring, Tai Shan. Bao Bao and Bei Bei have already been sent to China. Uh, five points to you for naming all those names I properly. And Nailed I it. That, I hope that the zoo someday will have pandas mm -hmm. again. I hope it works out. And there may be another animal that gets the uh, limelight after oh, that. We'll maybe. see. That'll do it for the News 4 Rundown. Thanks for joining us. I'm Tommy McFly. And I'm Anyang. We'll see you right back here tomorrow. Have a great night.